The meeting of the Plaquemines Council as sole governing authority of the Plaquemines Port Harbor and Terminal District is now called to order at 3.10 p.m. The machine is open for roll call. Let the record reflect that all nine commissioners are present. If we'll all rise, um, Commissioner Edwards will lead us in a prayer, followed by Commissioner Champagne with the pledge. The great and eternal God, we thank you for allowing all of us another day up on the land of living. We thank you, God, for the active use of all of our senses, dear God. We thank you for all your financial blessing and health blessing on all of us. God, we thank you for your traveling grace to this place. Now, God, as we come as civil service to be about the people business, God, we pray that whatever disagreement we had, that it wouldn't be done in an antagonistic way to God. That we remember the downtrodden, those who backs against the wall. And everything we do, we give you the glory, we give you the honor. It is in Jesus' awesome name we pray. Amen. 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 Welcome, everyone. We'll move on with the agenda, please. Item two, executive session. There are none. Item three, status report by the executive port director. So good afternoon. Uh, uh, this report includes an update of uh, several important activities and projects that are shaping the progress of the port. Uh, these endeavors guided uh, by a shared vision of creating sustainable growth uh, are vital to our success. I'd like to start off with our project with uh, sustainability partners. Um, per the freedom of information request uh, that came in for the SP contract, the port provided the entire contract, unredacted. Uh, all of the information is open to, to the public. Uh, we, we at the port believe in earned integrity, you know, and have elected not to protect any sensitive contract information for the sake of uh, being transparent uh, to the community. Um, all of the uh, SP public information requests have been satisfied. You know, moving forward, our next steps involve finalizing the rider agreement, uh, inserting Infinity Engineering into the contract replacing LA-23, executing the restated and amended service addendum contract, uh, and validating uh, the engineer design completeness to date. That's for phases two. Uh, we remain committed to upholding integrity and fostering trust in all of our partnerships, including with the community. Uh, the, the port and SP agree to all of the changes that are in that contract, in that amended restated agreement, and the document is fully executable at this point. So we are in agreement, uh, and that document is fully executable. Uh, moving on to Peters Road bypass project, you know, I'd like to just point out by, you know, stating that uh, the Peters Road bypass project is really a much higher priority for us because, you know, without without that bypass connectivity, it really makes that 11-mile extension very tough. So, uh, in recent meetings with key stakeholders such as uh, Jefferson's Parish, Gretna's Mayor, DOTD's multimodal office, the Regional Planning Commission, uh, and the Union Pacific Railroad, along with the Rio Grande Pacific. We've made con considerable progress in advancing this transformational rail bypass project. Our recent meetings have been very productive, and we plan a joint meeting to visit D.C. on September 20th and 21st. Uh, and I'd like to say that the Mercury Group's David Vitter is working diligently to assist us in scheduling those meetings. Uh, Jefferson Parish is currently preparing a co cooperative endeavor agreement to facilitate closer collaboration with the port. This agreement seeks uh, the active participation 
uh, of the port and 33% of the initial engineering uh, uh, design at a shared cost of about $750,000. This morning that CEA draft was actually provided uh, to the uh, entire commission and uh, we will be discussing that in the in the coming weeks. Uh, you know, furthermore, Jefferson Parish is actively pursuing, pursuing federal funding to complete a 30% engineering design at an, an additional estimated cost of $3.2 million. These combined, combined efforts will propel the realization of this rail project, which will create Louisiana's leading transformational rail corridor to drive future economic development. I'd like to emphasize this rail bypass timeline must be expedited with the highest priority because the port's SP 11 mile extension project depends on its connectivity. So it is a high priority. Uh, uh, myself and some of the commissioners uh, in front of me, we've sat in meetings uh, and we're, we're forwarding that project uh, because it is, it is it is critical to uh, everything that we're trying to do with growth. Moving on to the Point Lahash ferry ramp replacement, uh, productive discussions were held between the port and DOTD to discuss the design of the west and east bank ferry landings. Uh, DOTD has already shortlisted uh, two engineering firms, including subcontractors, to design the ramp. The new ferry landing design uh, will use the 2010 preliminary design as a baseline, but there are some some changes that you know, uh, the, the, and and those designs were not complete. But that will be a baseline. Uh, we at the port have requested a simultaneous completion of both ramps to expedite the process. Once the contract is awarded, we're, compete, we're committed to completing the project in less than 24 months. Uh, the estimated cost is about $14 million for both ramps. That's including barges, landing barges. Uh, and we've secured about $6.8 million in grants, grant and uh, bond funds uh, to date. Uh, additional funding is being sought to cover the remaining costs while the port is committed to matching 20% of the funds at an estimated uh, cost of about $2.8 million. Um, and uh, we will also be looking for some additional matching funds if we can find them. Moving on to the water booster station, uh, in collaboration with DOTD, we continue progressing on the Alliance water booster station project the design is a collaborative con contractual relationship with Kyle and Associates and Plaquemine Parish's government. Uh, this will boost the water pressure to Venice and is being advertised for bid this week as we speak. A contractor should be in place by September 1st. Uh, the project is scheduled to take 10 to 12 months depending on the equipment's lead time. The 20 inch water line will produce approximately 80 PSI uh, to help move water through the port facilities and to residents and businesses as far as Venice. The estimated cost of phase one is approximately $10 million and the project was just awarded the first $5 million from DOTD's uh, port priority fund. Uh, the port is committed to, uh, to match 10% uh, uh, of the funds from DOTD estimated at approximately a million dollars for phase one. Phase two will add an additional six miles of water line estimated at a cost of an additional nine million dollars. Uh, and this uh, phase two is, is not yet funded, but it is something that we're working diligently on completing. Uh, additionally, efforts are underway with the port and some of our partners uh, to strengthen the port sulfur water plant uh, providing cru crucial water production to balance demands between port growth and community requirements. Uh, I'd like to emphasize that uh, we are in direct communication with the parish 
um, and um, we we believe that uh, that you know we're moving in the right direction uh, as we drive port growth. You know that we're looking at ensuring that 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 growth uh, does not take away from parish resources. Market analysis: the ongoing market analysis, analysis, a vital component of our strategic planning, is progressing well and expected to complete. Uh, to be completed no later than September 23rd, uh, September 2023. This analysis will provide valuable insights into emerging opportunities and guide our decision-making process for future endeavors. The Piano Keys. The, the acquisition of land in the Piano Keys area is essential for continued port expansion. We successfully purchased all but six parcels, uh, with one parcel uh, under, uh, currently under contract. Uh, we, we, at the port, uh, attempted to reach agreements with the landowners through amicable negotiations with offers uh, made over market value, demonstrating our commitment to being fair and just. You know, however, despite our best efforts, uh, dating back as far as 2017, agreement could not be reached with the remaining six landholders. Uh, consequently, we must exercise our rights granted by the state and pursue alternative legal methods to secure these parcels. Uh, this strategic effort aligns with, with our long-term vision of owning the balance of Point Celeste Farms area to facilitate continued port expansion. Uh, our attorney from uh, Dwyer Cambray and our realtor from Ladder and Bloom are, are present here today and available for comment regarding uh, this land purchase. Uh, I am pleased to announce that our 2022 audit has been successfully concluded. The uh, audit provided us with valuable policy findings and observations, which have already been incorporated in a comprehensive corrective action plan. Most of the identified items have been remedied, strengthening our financial position. I would like to highlight that our net position has shown substantial growth, increasing from 63.8 million in 21 uh, to 116.8 million in 2022. This growth is, is primarily attributed to our strategic shift to becoming a landlord port and having land assets. Uh, I'd like to talk about the uh, capital outlay program for a second. Um, you know, with the port's growth that I, that I just mentioned, uh, there's a need for a new administrative building in the future. So our vision is to use the capital out, outlay program uh, by allocating funds over future years as part of our new master plan. We, we propose acquiring property at 8391 Highway 23, commonly called the farm, former Red Star Yeast Plant with the associated batcher. This property would serve as Plaquemines Port uh, administrative building, allowing the port to highlight, uh, host, facilitate regulatory, tenant, elected official, and community events. Our 2023 capital outlay uh, application deadline is October 2023. Uh, the ordinance introduction today of this item allows the port to issue a refundable $200,000 deposit uh, to secure the property. Uh, the port will make an offer based on the appraised value uh, with an estimated closing dated February 2024. I'd like to point out the cornerstone, uh, our lobbyists in uh, Baton Rouge has been uh, 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 critical in, in uh, providing valuable help navigating the capital outlay application process. Uh, I think I, I, it, I really would like to highlight some construction, some key construction activity that's taken place over the last couple of weeks. Uh, Venture Global completed the installation of the temporary pumps in the Point Celeste uh, pump station. 
In addition, Fieldway Construction submitted a proposal to the U.S. Corps of Engineers to be awarded a contract to clean the Point Celeste Canal. That canal is still uh, full of uh, debris from Hurricane Ida. Uh, no award has been announced on that yet, uh, but uh, uh, the port is also in co contact with the Corps of Engineers uh, on this issue. So in addition to these updates, I'd like to acknowledge the ongoing efforts uh, in our meetings, human resource initiatives, uh, and community engagements which contribute to the efficient functioning of the port. We're currently seeking critical positions, including a comptroller and a legal secretary, to strengthen our team and enhance our operational capabilities. As we move forward, we remain steadfast in our commitments to the public and uh, to public service and to sustainable growth. Together, we will continue to shape the future of this port and this parish. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tillotson. Um, I would like to uh, move to the board for comments with this caveat. Um, there was a lot of information presented, and I would uh, hope that the board would keep your comments based on all of the relevant issues, excluding just for this comment time, the uh, piano keys. Um, and then we'll have public comment after that. And again, if we could just keep your uh, comments and exclude them from anything in regard to the piano keys. Following that, we will expand our uh, information on the piano keys. We have representatives from the Dwyer firm and from Ladder and Bloom, along with Mr. Tillerson, to further expand on that process. Once that's done, we will revert to comments from the board in regards to the piano keys and then the public in regards to the piano keys. Floor is open. Any comments from the... Uh, Mr. Uh, Chairman, point of record. I thought we had changed the policy based upon what the state said, that the public would have comments before the council. Mr. Valley, you are out of order. But I, because of our relationship, I will answer that. I didn't say anything to, that con to the contrary of that. We are going to have public comment. But not in the order that, that has been agreed upon previously, recommended exactly by the state. Exactly in the order agreed upon. I disagree. Your prerogative, sir. Mr. Konovich. Well, well that's, that's what y'all, please. That's what y'all brought up. I respect you. I'd expect you to for. respect us. We don't need comments. Could you have Mr. Konovich's uh, microphone on? Yeah. I thought that's what we voted. Y'all introduced and y'all voted on it to let the public speak first, then the council speak. So now we're changing it. And go to the SP contract. Wait. I was. That's on voting items? No. That's on everything. <laughs> We've been doing it since his past, every administration or the, his update. Okay. Thank you, Hobble. Everything I said, switch. <laughs> Everybody at peace now? I apologize. Open to the public. Comment. The first issue that came, uh, Donald Valley, Bill Chase. First issue that came up was talking about our freedom of public records request that I made. Uh, and it was primarily due to the fact that you all would not release and look at the contract that was being voted on, that you all voted on exactly. Uh, and I'm glad you talk about transparency and want to do things and possibly uh, you can tell me who I need to su submit my invoice to that I spent a great deal of money with attorneys to get to that point. None for me. Now, it was represented to all of us that there was over 1,100 pages to that contract, very complicated. It was four lawyers that were dealt, dealt in this thing. It was ongoing. 
Well, yesterday, after numerous requests and discussions, we finally got to look at that document. I asked to look at it, not receive a copy of it, so I could determine what, what and how we wanted that document. Well, the document turned out to what I was presented, 156 pages only. And it was an incomplete document. It was not executed. It was not what I asked. Several people have told me that the other pages were addendums, changes modified. I was told that this thing was not retracted because of respect for me. However, I appreciate the respect, but the law says you can't retract things from it. And I, I just have difficulty understanding who's doing what, where, and how. You all told them to release that document to us. There's nothing secretive in that document. I'd probably tell you 90% of the pages that I looked at yesterday which is boilerplate, old language from the old contract. Mr. Tillerson was very kind to, he and I spoke with his staff and Mr. Melissa and is willing to show me the, the differences and what was in there. And it was very cooperative, it was no, no adversarial position. The way I left it with him was that until such time as they execute a contract and you all reapprove or approve a contract, you know, what you approved is not there. I doubt if all of you all read those 1,100 pages, and I, I know you all are not going to do it, but I'd, I'd sure love to see for the public's view, you hold your hand up and tell me you read all 1,100 pages, since there's none. That, there's not 1,100 pages, because I didn't see them. But I know you all got them, because I know you all sat there and voted upon it. You represented us. Some of you all didn't vote at all, or voted against it, rightfully so. All this originated from about four weeks ago, or four meetings ago, that I made a recommendation to you. I didn't say vote against it. I didn't say go forward with it. I didn't know what to do to take a position. I don't know how you all did, because I didn't see anything, 1,100 pages. All I asked you to do was defer it with ample time for you all to have a chance to review it in detail to make certain that's why you wanted it. This was a major issue that it was a lawsuit filed by the previous council, which you all are aware of. You all decided to drop that lawsuit. We don't know why, but justified it. What do we get out of this, the redoing or the amendment copy of the contract? I assume you all get to see that this time when you get to vote on it again or get to reintroduce this whole thing. Because I don't think, you didn't vote upon anything that's valid. And in all fairness to Mr. Tillerson, he's more than willing to show me that information when, and when it gets done. And he's telling me that they are pretty much prepared. This thing has been renegotiated, redrafted numerous times. They have to find the right draft to give me. Well, you know, what they gave you is all I asked for. A valid copy, an executed copy that you voted upon. I don't do business like that. And I sure hope you all change your ways a little bit about what's going on here. Now, there's much other stuff that I would like to talk about besides that. And by the way, who can I submit my invoice to, my expenses that I went through, to get a copy of a document I should have gotten and the public should have had in the beginning? It's not funny. I put out my money. And you all told them to give me a copy. Mr. Champagne, all you all cooperated. I mean, you, all, you all knew what to do, you know, and you offered, you told them to do it. But they go back to the, looking for any excuse not to give it. Where truth and fact, if all you had to do is say, we're not finished negotiating. And the law provides that you don't have to release that information as long as there's negotiations going on. And I just find a problem. Am I out of time? I appreciate those comments, and, and I take them to heart. Um, we've talked. we talked about this. we talked about it. You know, Chris and I have talked about it. I mean, a couple of council members and I have talked about it. It's disheartening, you know. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Public? Board members? Mr. Konovich. We voted last meeting. Because the contract was done, signed. We, we was approving that contract. Now I hear y'all still in negotiations, 
in the meeting before that, you gave us a summary of what was said to be 1,100 pages. And the only reason you make a contract with 1,100 pages, you don't want nobody to read it. You don't want them to know what's in it. So your summary just told me what you wanted me to know. That's how I feel. And then to come find out that it's only 158 pages and this board voted on it, I voted no because I've yet to see a contract. Can you explain why we, why we don't have a contract? Well, I, absolutely. Uh, I think the council voted uh, for us to execute the contract. So we didn't execute the contract before the vote. We, we received a vote to be approved to execute the contract. And as I mentioned in my comments, the contract is executable. Now, now we slowed down after the last meeting when the public information requests came in and when I put my commercial hat on and releasing a competitive contract which which our competitive state port systems could have access to, I question whether or not I wanted to redact anything. And so we we spent time with the ports attorneys, including Mr. Garrett with SP's attorneys, we went through everything and we determined, based on my recommendation, that look, let's just not redact anything, let's put it all out there. SP agreed, uh, we, we, we looked at the, the last documents on last Friday and we all had a total thumbs up on over the weekend that we don't have any legal issues here, release the entire contract. But it was not executed, but it is executable. There, there is no question between the port and SP on where we stand with this contract. Uh, and we, we've had our council look at it, and we've had SP's council look at it, and we have a member of SP in the audience, uh, who is also willing to to uh, make comments on on SP's position. So, so again, I just want to reiterate, the vote three weeks ago was giving us the authority to execute the contract. But because of what we went through with making sure that we were going to release everything, we just hadn't executed it yet. But what I'd like to point out is the comments that were in my report reflect that there's, there's two things that we need to do before we execute, and that is we need to plug in the Infinity Engineering rider to replace LA-23, and we need to sign the amended restated service addendum. Now, somehow we got to 1,100 pages in the contract, I, I don't know, maybe I said that, I'm not really, I don't remember where that number came from, uh, but what I, what I can tell you is the contract that was pro provided in the public information request is the full contract, but what I will also tell you is that there are a, a, a lot of emails and a lot of communication back and forth on how we came to all of the amendments and changes. Well, I must be out of that email loop because I haven't gotten any. And you are the one that said 1,100 pages. And if the contract wasn't ready to sign, you didn't have to give him a copy. Because once you came up to us and said, here's, here's the contract ready to go, we need to execute it and we vote on it, then it makes it public record. So before that, you didn't have to give him a copy. The contract is ready to sign. It's executable today. It was executable three weeks ago. But now we're renegotiating? We, I, I'm not really sure where you got renegotiating from, but the port is not renegotiating. We're, we're there. 
And then the other questions I had about the plan, but we're going to wait on that, he said. Commissioner Schultz. So five weeks ago, we were supposed to vote on this contract because it was ready. We deferred it because of the public and everything. And we actually had some minor changes before that. So we wanted to look at it. I read the contract, 150 something pages. At that time, under the understanding that we were voting on it, or not voting on it, we we're going to sign it within a day or two of approval. To me, the what the public can see and not see doesn't impact whether the contract can be signed. If, it, if there's no more negotiations than sign it, we can deal with what the public can and can't see through the public records request. So my question is, has there been a single change? Because I, I found out Monday that we had not signed it. So I asked for the most updated copy. I have been, I'm about page 70 of the 150 pages reading through it. Has there been a single change since we voted on it three weeks ago? So the the addition of the the infinity rider agreement mm -hmm. that was released after the last meeting, and so that's in front of infinity right now, which is really the contract that connects infinity, the port, and SP. And we knew about the but the, rider. But the contract. Has yeah, not changed. Has not changed. So, As a matter of fact, we confirmed that with Mr. Danny Garrett, Garrett uh, everything that we have in the contract over this last week. So my question is, next question is on the rider. We were supposed to vote on this five weeks ago. Why wasn't? And then we deferred it because of the the optics. So why didn't we work on the rider in that meantime? And then when we voted on it, like I said, I was under the impression that. We were going to sign it within a day or two, and I find out by chance about discussing something else that the contract is still not signed. Yeah, that's so I request a current contract where when I get asked a question, I know what's going on. And we're now Thursday. I got the contract Monday by request, and I'm still not done reading it. So it makes us look like we don't know what's going on. Right. And yeah. we need to make that – we need to correct that going forward. If, if we're going to have a contract that we're voting on – it needs to be fully executable within three days or something. I mean, I, that's my view. If I'm voting on contract, it should be done. Right. So, so uh, Commissioner Schultz, uh, what I'd like to point out is that at the last meeting, we also voted on approving Infinity to be put in. Right. So, so we we had to get through that hurdle. So we're taking steps to finalize the agreement but but the, the let's make sure we're very clear on what we are executing and what's that question the question is has the the contract for the concession agreement changed and that contract has not the amendment the restated addendum that we have today has not changed since we had the meeting five weeks and ago. And I have not noticed any noticeable. It has not changed. I, I'm just saying, I, I, I'm only about halfway through, and I have not noticed anything. It has not but changed. the thing is, on the vote, was a task order to Infinity. Nothing, to me, that's not really inserting the right. I'm just saying, if we're going to vote on a contract that's executable, you keep saying it's executable, then let's sign it. And, I mean, with the what are we waiting on at this point besides the rider? So, 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 so we're waiting. We're waiting for the rider. We're, we're finalizing the rider, and really, we could sign the contract today. We agree on the terms. We just haven't. Now, what 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 I would like to point out on the the um, the task order is a separate issue because we have a project management right. agreement with Infinity Engineering. So we, we actually executed a task order to allow them to be Correct. inserted in. Correct. So okay. now we just have to create the connection in the rider agreement to replace LA-23 because if you really read the last item in the, the uh, uh, I think it's either item 14 or 15 in that uh, um, amended agreement, it, uh, it puts infinity in. Okay to be the project manager officially in that contract. And that had to happen. 
Okay, yeah, I understand that. So, my last question, because as you, um, when is it going to be signed? At this point, when are we going to sign it? Because that's what everybody wants to know. We, we will, we will, we will have it signed uh, um, soon. But what I will say, and I want to make sure that I'm very clear to the council as a whole, the port has been working diligently with Jefferson Parish to to uh, to partner to bring the bypass, you know, uh, uh, up to to the same timeline as the SP contract because we can sign it today, we can we can build it out within a year, but if it takes us five years to build the bypass, what did we just do? So we, we, we the port is focused on priorities. Well, that's what we're focused on. Then why did we rush to sign the con uh, or give approval to to execute the agreement? So we have approval to execute the agreement, and and we appreciate that approval. But we are we are working the priorities, and we want to make sure that when we move forward, when we when we execute this agreement and we finish spending another. Um, Two and a half million dollars to get us to eight million dollars. That we have a firm understanding of what's happening in Jefferson Parish with the bypass, and that we're 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 at the table. And what I will tell you, and Commissioner Champagne can attest to this. Six months ago, we didn't have a seat at the table in Jefferson Parish. Well, what, what I will say is we did not have a seat at the table, and we were told by political leaders that we didn't have a seat at the table. And so they've welcomed us in, and we have met monthly. And, in, and since, since the last meeting three weeks ago, we've met with Jefferson Parish's president, Gretna's mayor. Uh, we've met with the Office of Multimodal. We've met with the Regional Planning Commission. So we have a seat at the table. We're planning, you know, to be part of driving this project forward so that we can define what the timeline will look like, you know, for building out the bypass. Because that's what's important to us, because if there's if there's a five year delay in building the bypass you know, we, we need to think about that, and we want to make sure that you as a commissioner understand that we're looking at those priorities. Are you? Mr. Tillotson. Yes, ma'am. Um, the concession of the portion of the contract, that's a legal term for terms of the contract, is that solidified at this point? That it is executable. We. Uh, the port and its council uh, is in agreement with SP and its council that we have a concession agreement. Uh, it, it is a legal concession agreement, and and we are uh, standing here today, ready to execute the agreement. We just haven't done it yet. Okay. So you don't see any obstacles to getting together other than perhaps a schedule. I don't see any obstacles at all. Okay. For our benefit, do you have a timeline when you think this may be executed? Uh, it, it will be executed soon. We, we, uh, we are, are focused. Our focus, we've got to remember, everybody, the last month our focus has been on closing out the 22 audit and aligning ourselves with Jefferson Parish. So I want to say to the council and to the parish, we've been a little busy. I understand that's been so. So we we are setting priorities, and and we are going to execute the contract. Uh, we don't have it on the calendar when we're going to do that yet. Okay. But what I would like to do is, you know, at at some point, when we have uh, our attorney and, and and realtor come up, I'd like to also have SP come up and give give their thoughts on this as well so that that uh, you could understand that we've done a lot of work over the last months we unraveled 
a very complicated contract. We spent a lot of hours. We put it back together. We're in agreement. We're ready to execute. We just haven't put it on the calendar yet. But we haven't put it on the calendar not because we're not, you know, being proactive to get it done. We've been extremely busy with the audit and with Jefferson Parish. Could we say, I hate to put you to a timeline, but could we say by the next meeting or by the meeting after that, you think? Okay. Is there a trigger point in the bypass contract negotiations that would allow us to feel comfortable with easily moving forward to sign the contract? Uh, yes, I think I think we're we're at the trigger point now. We 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 sent you guys a copy of the CEA with Jefferson Parish on the bypass. Yes. Uh, so what we want to make sure that we're doing with the council is being very transparent on what we as a port, how we're conducting our business sitting at the table with Jefferson Parish. So for me, the trigger point to move forward is for us to agree and approve that CEA. And, and once we do that, then I can, I can you know, uh, clearly state that we officially are at the table and we are helping to drive this project forward uh, and having influence on the timeline. So that sounds like the stepping points that we need to take. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I yield. Commissioner Edwards. Yes. I, I, I'm hoping, Mr. Tilt, that in the future, because I, I, I'm very surprised about the narratives around this contract because. I was understanding we was being put under pressure so you can execute a contract. That was my understanding. And I was and I was putting a lot of trust in the Pope to handle that business. No, I tell the Pope I did not read the eleven hundred dollar eleven hundred page document that was told to us or the hundred and fifty page because I rely upon all the legal mind that we have to execute something and give them the trust. And while you're giving us a lot of narrative it still gets to the fact that you came to us with the understanding everything was ready to be executed. I'm here now to, we, to step this. All those, the, the narrative still doesn't justify the fact that we were put under pressure like a door or something would, would be executed. I think it not only put us in a bad position, but it caused the, uh, the public to ask a lot of questions too. So I'm hoping that in the future that when, when the Pope comes to us, that you're ready to execute a contract. And not because you wanted to give it to you, and then you can sit on it for two months or whatever you do. To me, that's not the way we're supposed to do it. If you come to us and saying we got, I expect in a week or so, that means that everything was done. When you say you want to execute, I'm assuming that Mr. Gary, you all the legal minds that get together, every T is crossed, every dot is I, however that saying go, we just read and signed it. But to say that we was almost pressed into doing something and then still sitting out there. And I just think you got to get better than the word soon. The word soon is too vague. The word soon is too vague. We need to get this contract executed because we're on the line for voting and putting our trust in you. I don't give my trust to too many people. And we give you our trust. And I find out that what we trust you to do is just sitting out there. I don't like that being said out there because I don't like to be put in the position you know, uh, where it's really it's an embarrassing position to really be in. So while you're giving us a lot of narrative, to me, it still doesn't cut the muster in terms of how we was forced, not forced, but put under pressure like that uh, contract was going to be executed like almost the next day. So I'm really very disappointed. And I just, I'm just saying I hope the future that when you come to us for something, that means you're ready to execute it and that you want us to give it to you and then you can be doing negotiation. You don't negotiate something. You know, when you come to us, everything should be negotiated. All the negotiation is finished. But don't come to us, ask us to give you authority so you can continue to negotiate. That's just me. I can't speak for the council member. Well, well I, 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 I take, 
take that under advisement, but I would like to clarify, we're not continuing to negotiate. There are no negotiations going on. There's been no negotiations that have taken place since we have since we've received approval. So we we have an agreement to execute the agreement. We will get it executed. Um, uh, what you see sitting here at this table in front of you is the entire port executive staff. And when you think about what we just presented uh, in, in, in the executive director comments, we've been extremely busy. Excuse me. I, I am not questioning the busy, how busy the staff is. I'm still saying is that stay busy doing what you're doing, but when you come to us, you're no longer business. The contract is ready to be signed. So no question that you're working hard, you're doing a lot of stuff. I heard the narrative. The only thing I want to put on your impression that when you come to us, you mean the staff have been very busy doing the work for the contract, and when we say go, the contract is ready to be signed. Because it's still coming back that you're still busy. I'm through with the president. Commissioner Newsom. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Tell, we're not gonna, I'm not going to speak on the contract. I think we've done <laughs> Everybody's done hashed that out enough. And Thank you. Everybody's <laughs> feeling, <laughs> what I'm going to speak on is the um, talk to you about. I, I, I want to, I, I, I don't know if I'm correcting you or not, but the meeting I attended with the uh, Peter Bypass with all the players to be pretty high level meeting. They had some folks there. And for you to say you had a seat at the table, I think that's wrong. You were at the head of the table. You're leading the show. The port, Blackman's port, is leading that charge. And I just, again, it's it, guys, how understanding and how important that is to, like, and to work together because we can build a port. We can have the rail. But how many, do we want all this cargo to come through Bell Chase? Gretna don't want it to come through there. They're not going to allow it. So that's why it's, it's so important for us to get that Peters Road bypass. And, and get that stuff going that way. And, and look, it, it ain't going to happen tomorrow. It ain't gonna, it's, it's a little ways down the thing, down the road. But uh, those are the important facts, and, and that's what I wanted to speak on about um, how important that really is. And uh, just let's keep that ball rolling with the city of Gretna, with Jefferson Parish, DOTD, the state, everything. So with that, I yield. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I think that one of the questions that was asked uh, needs to be, uh, your response needs to be clarified. Um, Commissioner Schultz asked about anything being added to the contract since we last spoke. And correct me if I'm wrong, but there was um, some information relative to the buyout in regards to SP should we decide to bond out the rest of the rail. Did we add that back in? No, that's that's actually not in the contract, but that is that is documented in the email chain, and it is something that a conversation that we had with Mr. Danny Garrett, and he can he can speak to that. That we 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 have that information. Uh, we have agreement with SP on what a buyout would look like, uh, and and it is something that. Uh, you know, maybe uh, Danny Garrett may want to speak on. Yes, yes. Um, so that was one of the issues that we worked through in the discussions uh, with SP. And rather than change the entire structure of the contract, what we did is we entered into essentially an, an email discussion of the interpretation of that provision of the contract and so therefore if there was ever a dispute in the future we have documentation that the parties have agreed on how the buyback would be handled under the contract so so there was a discussion about possibly putting that in the contract and we we never we we talked about it uh, we on the port we it was an issue that maybe we thought we should have that but we define at the final uh, you know end of, of 
figuring out what what direction we were going to go in with the buyout. The buyout is not in the contract, but it is agreed upon in writing. So so if we opt to to leave today, we know what that off ramp is. If we finish the intellectual property, we know what that off ramp is. Uh, you know, once we you know get to committing eight million dollars. My, that that was the key, one of the key points of the whole declaratory judgment, and then we're not going to put that in the contract. And I understand it's a I understand it's in documentation, but the summary we were given that was part of the summary, and then now it's not in the contract. And I'll admit I missed it the first time when I read through it. I found out after the fact, but was told it was going to be put in the contract. It's not, but I understand legally. The documentation is fine, but to me, that was one of the key points of the declaratory judgments, and now we're not going to have it in the contract clearly spelled out. I do. Do you want me to mention SP, Doctor Gooey? Do we want SP to come up and maybe give a brief summary from their point of view? Do you mind? If representative from SP can come up and just give a overview of where y'all stand with this, just. Not that we. I'd like to say. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I yield too. <laughs> it's not in the contract now, and that was this one of the specific things that was the problem. And we've talked to you about bonding ourselves, bonding it out ourselves. So now that's not even in the contracts. It's in the email. So you're going to sign the contract, and then a couple years down the line, we're going to come up and say. We want to do the. We want to do a bond and own it ourselves. So now we got to go to email. Well, I'm sure they got a pretty good lawyer. That email ain't signed. You ain't signed. You ain't. It ain't agreed to. It ain't where the paper is written on that email. You could put it with the showman in the bathroom. And now it's not in the contract. So when he builds the rail. He's going to keep it because now he wants to own, get paid for every container that goes across that. Instead of the parish getting picked that money and paying the rail off, we're going to let somebody else own it. And then we're going to have to go back after we paid the $50 million to, for him to build it, we got to buy it back from him. I'm done. Thank you, uh, Hobo. Who's up? Hey, good afternoon. Chris Ferrari, Baton Rouge. Sorry, Chris Ferrari, Baton Rouge. Um, no, I think the, and you have to forgive me, I wasn't the attorney on the specifics of the contract negotiation over the last few months, but I, I know a little bit, so if there's questions I can't answer, I'm sorry, I can bring it back. But uh, to to your question, the, now, Danny, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the provision has always been and continues to be in there, that the allowance for the buyout is in that contract. I think what Mr. Tillotson was saying is that the specific terms and the projected values of that buyout at different intervals is what was being clarified in the email chain. But the right to buyout is there and is in the contract and can be executed at any time. Um, the from our standpoint, you know, we've you know, Charles asked us to be patient. You know, I know some of you guys are new and, and uh, some of you guys have been here for a while. And, you know, we were asked to be patient, go through the process. There's a lot of requests. I think, um, you know, we've been you know, faithful at, at kind of marching down the road at trying to answer everybody's questions. We've given time. You know, we're more than, help, more than willing to help out, clarify anything in the future questions. I mean, I, I hope that at least from SP's point through Charles and maybe directly or indirectly, you know, I, I'd hate to walk away thinking that we didn't answer questions or didn't provide time or didn't provide assistance in trying to clarify or, or make adjustments that make it beneficial for everybody. Um, you know, we still believe in the project. We think it's a huge opportunity for both the parish, the people here, Jefferson Parish, you know, the industry itself. You know, of course, we're making an investment, so it would be beneficial for us as well. But. Uh, you know, as it stands today, I mean, we still remain optimistic. We want to be part of the project, and 
you know, we're ready to execute whenever the signed document comes back to us. So to my knowledge, uh, there's been no adjustments of the contract from when it was approved several weeks ago. Um, I'm just working on the assumption that whenever Charles is ready to sign, you know, we're kind of heeding his best judgment as trying to play the navigate the, the, the grander scheme projects associated with the 11 mile road, uh, rail, sorry. And yeah, I mean, we just, we still remain optimistic and willing to kind of move forward and continue the project whenever you guys are ready. Um, I mean, again, I mean, it's, my hope is that, you know, you, we're here to help, right? We want to see this project happen. I think you guys want this project to happen. Um, you know, so it's, we're just kind of, you know, I've been sitting down waiting, you know, hopefully to get back to work. So um, if there's any questions, you know, it's. Council members. I, uh, can I, can I respond to uh, Commissioner Cognovich? Um, you know, one of the things that I want to point out and, and I mean, it was just stated here by SP there was never a question on whether or not we, we could buy it out. We could buy it out today. We could buy it out a year from now, five years from now, ten years from now. We have the contractual ability to do that. The, the question was, how much is it? That wasn't clear, right? And so now we know if we wanted to buy out today, we know what that approximate number is. If we wanted to buy out, if we wanted to finish phases three and four, so we have phases one through four complete at $8 million, and if we wanted to say at that point we'd like to buy it out and do a revenue bond, we know what that approximate number is. We didn't know that before. That was the issue. The issue wasn't could we buy it out or could we bond it out, because we could always do that. We knew that. We just didn't know what it would cost us. Yeah, but we didn't that know. That was the buyout. And I, under my understanding, when you re did the doing the contract, that was all we was voting on, engineer design and permitting. Then we would go from there and say, what do we want to do? Do we want to stay with SP and let them, or, or are we going to go for bonds? But now it's all in one contract again, so it's debt. Because we're not paying him to engineer and design. We're paying another company. We're just borrowing money from him. Uh, actually, I think the, to clarify that, the contract is still only exclusive to the intellectual property and the engineering and permitting. You, would still, you still have the opportunity to, to take it on for the construction piece. They're not, they're not put together. It's together? No, it's not put together. Yeah, we gotta, it's not in the contract, so you, you're going to build it. If you want us to. If you don't, that's fine. We, we haven't gotten it's to that. It's all lawyer bullshit. No. We haven't gotten to that trigger point yet on, I mean, once we finish the intellectual property, once we complete 100% design, we could decide that we're going to bond that out and build it ourselves. Or we can decide to continue with this relationship, with the concession buy agreement. Out. What we got to buy out? We borrowed eight million dollars from him to do the design, engineering, and permitting. So what we got to buy out if we say we're going to bond it out? What plus the eight million we got to buy out? What plus the it's, I don't it's have eight million we, plus what? We 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 put it in the in the summary. So if we get to eight million dollars, uh, and we decide that we are not going to go forward with SP, it's going to be approximately. $9 million total for us to go in a direction without SP. So they're getting a million dollars for us to buy it it's, it's going to be because, the, you know, they've deployed the capital, they've carried the capital with the intent, the contractual intent to finish a concession agreement where the concessionary revenues would take care of, of what the, the capital they, that they deployed. But we voted for the declaratory judgment because it was debt. And it canceled the contract until we went to court. Then you got five people on this board to vote to get rid of it. So now it, it's not debt 
or is it dead? We'll sign. Yeah, we'll sign. I'm done. Uh, Mr. Garrett, did you have some clarification? I'll try to clarify, sir. So the authority to buy out of the concession agreement was always in it. The difficulty was that the original form of this contract was originally designed to be a turnkey construction project, but was entered into it was the the purpose of it was actually scaled back to just the pre-construction services but a lot of the language in the underlying contract kept referencing back to for lack of a better term infrastructure but there was no infrastructure so that so when you tried to calculate what the buyout would be under the existing contract there were terms in the contract that didn't that didn't make any sense that's why we engaged with SP in a discussion of the method by which a, the buyout of the concession agreement applicable just to the pre-construction services would be calculated so that we could have a number that we could rely on. That's what we documented through those email uh, items. And, and those email items are that they're part and parcel of the agreements of the party, uh, that they would be just as admissible as the, the physical contract itself. So, but there is, so the contract still does not apply to actual construction. It still is applicable only to the pre-construction activities. But what we hopefully have done now is structured in such a way so that we, we, un, we can more accurately understand that it's concession agreement applicable just to the pre-construction activities and how much it would cost to buy out if we decided not to uh, use SP for the second phase. Uh, what, uh, before I bring up the, the next uh, council speaker, I have uh, two things I'm going to ask you. Maybe we can put this to rest. Um, it's my understanding that once we have a CEA with Jefferson Parish, we should be in a comfort zone to where we could execute the contract. Mm -hmm. now, is that what we're going to do? It's definitely a trigger point, and it's something that we were looking at and working to expedite. Okay. What would you need from us to sign it once that CEA with Jefferson Parish is complete? Do we need to take action, or are well, you just going to do it? I mean, what I would really like to do, I think what would be beneficial is we provided that, that the draft CEA, and that CEA went before Jefferson Parish. Did it go today? Yesterday. Yesterday, did it? So we're waiting to get a response on, on you know, how that was voted. But if we would just really like to make sure that the council sees what's in that, that CEA because it is a – because we're going to have to introduce that. So before we introduce it, we want to make sure that you see what's in it. So my point is that so, – So if you – if you The CEA if – you, if, you if the council takes a look at the CEA and, and we're in agreement – that you know it, it's in our best interest we're going to move forward with it we'll execute the agreement we have to introduce that f to get us to approve it correct once it's approved that will be the trigger to make give us to a comfort zone to where we'll execute the contract yeah yes 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 sir okay the other point is uh, there's been back and forth about the uh, what do you call it Charles the, um, the ra off ramp off-ramp information. Okay, it's my understanding that it's in the contract, but it's not specific in the contract, that there's emails that make uh, specify exactly what that means. The approximate amount is not in the contract. It refers to there is one, but as uh, Mr. Garrett said, you, when, you look at the, when you look at the contract, it's not clear how you get to a final number. So, so we sat down and with with our attorneys and with SP attorneys, and we we have that off wrap number at 5.7 million, which is where we at after phase two, and we know what the off ramp would be after eight million if we choose to finish, execute and finish phases three and four. So I think there'd be a comfort zone that we would uh, would uh, be acceptable then, 
if there was some way to add as an addendum or into the contract those numbers because I keep hearing about it and it doesn't seem to, we don't seem to have any consensus of agreement as to that we trust that so if we know the numbers Ms. Ube, somehow get it in as an addendum or whatever so that it's in writing and then anyone here can say well this is it if a, if a constituent this is it this we, we, we can go after that but I, th I think uh, Danny Garrett just stated in the back that it it it's it's in writing and uh, Danny can you clarify your your point on what we the details that we have yeah like I said the that was that was the difficulty is is using because it's essentially two contracts you, you the service stem refers back to the, the the primary contract and again the primary contract was actually designed for a complete for, for a, a physical construction contract not for pre-construction so what we essentially do did is enter into agreements with attorneys for SP as to what the ambiguous language meant so that that's and, and, and I believe that would be acceptable in a court as to if the court is trying to dissolve to decide if there was a dispute as to what it meant we've got documentation from both sides agreeing to what those terms mean and that was the importance of getting that and we even gave them like I said what Charles said literally hypotheticals if we bought out at this point if we bought out at this point if we bought out at this point uh, so that there would to eliminate any question between the parties as to what what the what the buyout of the concession agreement would be at various stages understood it the first time exactly understand it so now all i asked was is there a way we can put it in to satisfy us at the table who want to see it in how would we do that would it be an addendum would it have to go into the contract which means adding something to the contract you, you could Just do it as an us. addendum no. and i mean i'm uh, I don't believe the port would have a problem in doing it. SP would have to agree to physically add it to the addendum. Can we make that move and see if sure. we get agreement from SP? Let us know. Sure. It seems to be the we're repeating the same thing over and over and over and over, and that's that may be a solution. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Edwards. Oh, uh, Mr. Garrett, answer my question because when uh, Commissioner Conovich brought up the talk about this declaratory judgment. I like, no, we can't be going down that road again. So I'm satisfied that that's not the road um, we're going down. But I will say this, it is obvious to everybody sitting to here that a lot of work haven't been done that needed to, that should have been done. Because we should not be here this long discussing this contract and the way we're doing it if stuff was resolved. So I, I, I'm really sort of disappointed that we almost here negotiation doing negotiation for a contract when we shouldn't even be doing this that's what we hire people to do so i'm just hoping that we can do much better and i'm hoping that we can get this contract signed that's the whole thing the key thing is getting this contract signed and i'm not here i understanding when it's going to be signed you know, I really don't know. I can't really say when. I I haven't got a definite answer. Only that I hope it's done soon. Mr. Tillotson, I'd also like to see all the terms in the contract. Is there a reason why we wouldn't want to put that in there? Is anything proprietary? Is uh, SP going to object to that? We we will we'll have the conversation with SP's attorney. Okay. So um, I'd like to know. If it's legal for us to go ahead and introduce the Jefferson Parish CEA for next week so that we can vote on this I mean next next meeting is it possible to put it in the introduction it will it will be introduced but before we put it out there for introduction we we made sure that we got it in front of, of the council so it'll be at our next week, we will have it on our agenda to be introduced. Okay. I'm just trying to – normally we don't want to rush a contract, but given all the circumstances surrounding this, it's becoming very imperative that we get this contract signed as soon as possible. There are things that are frustrating people 
that might bring about other actions, and that's why I'm saying we need to move forward expeditiously. Thank you. Mr. Shields. So to be clear, at this point, we're a month away from signing the contract that we approved three weeks ago is basically where we're at. So the, the, the contract is executable right I, now. I get that. But we're not going to sign it until a month from now, at earliest, until we vote on the CEA for Jefferson Parish. If they passed it. We don't even know if they passed it. So, so are you inferring that you would like for us to to go ahead and move forward and not know what we're going to do with the bypass and not have a seat no, at that I, table? I because that's that. what I'm hearing. No, I'm what, what I'm, I'm hearing that from you. I I would like to know that these were the conditions that we were going to sign the contract before I voted on it. Well, we've been talking about the Jefferson Parish. Bypass but it was never a condition of four months. Contract. We voted on the contract based on those terms, and we were under an impression that it was going to be signed. And now we're three weeks later, more like five weeks, because we were supposed to vote on it a month ago, and now we were saying that there's certain terms that we need to meet before we sign that contract. It makes us look like we don't know what's going on. I'm just saying, you got to look at it from our standpoint. Thank we you. were supposed to vote on it five weeks ago. And our understanding at that time was we were going to sign it after we agreed on it. I agree. We've been talking about Justin Parrish this whole time. But that was never mentioned as one of the conditions to actually execute the contract. It's executable. I get that. But we're talking about a month now. So that's two months after we originally were supposed to vote on this. No, more than almost three months at that point. I still support the whole project based on what I've read in the contract. I think it's a, it's can work. I'm not saying I don't support the project, but I'm not happy with this the way this whole thing. I almost did a suspension, but I know I don't have the votes for a suspension to rescind that until we can get the until we're ready to actually sign it. But I know I don't have votes to suspend the rules. So this is where we where are we saying? Like I said, I support the pro project based on everything that I read in the con the new not I don't want to say new contract because it's the same contract, but. Everything I read since the one I got Monday is the same. But we were led to believe that, like Ms. Edwards said, we needed to get this done where we can get moving. Yet now we have other conditions that are being told that we need to meet before we can sign it. So I yield. So, uh, Ms. Oob, can you get us uh, a quick resolution for introduction regarding the, the, the CEA? And that way we can get that on the table and reduce the, potentially reduce the time from a month to two weeks. And hopefully Jefferson Parish did their thing, and it's just a matter of reading it and, and going with it. Then we can put this to rest for right now. Okay, because I think we're going to be here a while with the next few stuff. So if we could, uh, on, on the, okay, on the, uh, before we close out, on the where it says introduction of ordinances and resolutions, let's just push that to the back of the agenda, so because we may have that resolution. Commissioner Champagne. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I waited till all the uh, my colleagues spoke, and I've been involved with uh, Mr. Tillis about these negotiations. And I will tell you, everything's been done with good intentions, and this is difficult. It, it, it's very hard to do. He was correct uh, with us getting the. Uh, our partners with Jefferson Parish and Gretna involved because this thing is regionally transformative and we recognize that when we recognize there's some shortfalls with the rail that have to be rectified now um, Mr. Schultz made a, a, a great point uh, I had no idea that that this became a condition to the contract until today we spoke this morning um, in the back of my maybe I should have figured that out and I'm guilty of that because I've been involved in these negotiations but I didn't know that was a stopping point. I thought we were there. I think we're still there on the contract. I think I think we should still move forward. But I'm fortunate that I've been involved in some of the intricate planning of this thing where my colleagues have not. And I think we owe them some time to figure this out some more and get in the weeds on this some more. I know that it's good, but I'm one of nine. I think uh, Dr. Gooey may be in the same condition, but again, it'll be two of nine. I, I don't know if the other seven are convinced. They convinced that the project is sound and that we're on the right track, but I, I just think that all the dots have not been connected. Again, I, I, I did not know that 
Jefferson Parish was going to be a, a decision point for us whether we move forward or not. So I yield. Uh, um, I, I would just like to point out that that it's not a, a contractual decision point. I want to make sure to clarify that. Uh, it makes good business sense to ensure that that we are going to have a bypass, which I believe we will. But I, I, I would like to, to, you know, have that CEA in place so that uh, we understand what that looks like. So it's it's really more of a business uh, decision, you know, balancing all of the different factors that we're balancing. I mean, it's, it's, it's the same reason why purchasing, trying to purchase the, the land for the container terminals, we're, we're, we're holding that because we're getting first things done first. So we're setting priorities, we're making sound business decisions. Uh, look, we have, we have the opportunity to build the biggest container terminal on the Gulf Coast. It all depends on the rail. It just depends on the rail. So we got to make sure we get that right. And if we, if we, if we come out of the chute too fast, build the 11 mile extension, you know, four years before, you know, we're ready with the bypass, it means either we don't move rail or we move it through Gretna, which is going to be constrained uh, and it's going to be problematic. So, so what we're doing is we're balancing all of these different business factors, you know, trying to get to the end result of building a container terminal. Thank you. Um, enough? No, enough. Okay. Um, Chris, you still up? Yes or no? You got the floor. Yes. I am cute in. Oh, thank you, Ronnie. So back to Jefferson Parish, and you, you said it just now. To build the rail and not have Jefferson on board, we don't want to do that. We agree with that. However, what we agreed to vote on was just the intellectual property. So there's no reason, the more I think about I mean, I'm not saying let's rush to decision right at this point, but if it's just the intellectual pro property, That's and we already put $5.7 million, are we willing to walk away from $5.7 million or spend the remaining whatever and at least have the intellectual property and then we can decide, Jefferson Parish, if they're on board. But I'm not willing to walk away from $5.7 million because Jefferson Parish. We might, it might take us five years. I agree. But at least we'll have the plans. And that's what we voted on. I agree. I, I agree that, I mean, we, we want to finish the intellectual property. I agree. We want to do that. And we plan to do that. But we're, we're sitting here real time, and we had back-to-back -back discussions two weeks in a row with Jefferson Parish. We're at a place where, you know, we, we, we have some new information, and what we're trying to do is align the business requirements. And we want to make sure that you have a chance to look at that CEA and that it all makes sense. All right. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Appreciate appreciate the comments. I think that was well worth it. I think we needed to go through that, Charles, uh, and uh, agree. get some alignment, maybe better understanding. So thanks. Uh, I'd like to move back now on your comments, uh, and I would uh, like you to uh, go back to the piano keys, bring up anyone that you'd like to bring up, and then we will let the public make comments before we come to the table. So you were right. You're on. Okay, thank you. I'd, I'd like to bring up uh, Ms. Suzanne Cambray from Dwyer Cambray just to talk about the, the, the process. Good afternoon, everyone. Suzanne Cambray. Our firm's been involved in many of the land acquisitions for the past few years. Uh, we currently have, and you'll be considering <clears throat> for approval, five lots from Point Celeste Farm subdivision for expropriation and I just want to emphasize that we the team that's trying to assemble this very critical property 
goes through every effort, every attempt to try to reach a negotiation with the landowners with an acceptable price. Uh, once we've determined that this property is critical to, to our industrial development and enterprise, we really try to work with the landowners and it's only as a last resort do we have to resort to uh, the expropriation process. And that process as well is very extensive. You have to have, as Reverend Edwards said, all your T's crossed and I's dotted in order to comply with that and make sure that it's at an appropriate taking. There's a notice provision, two appraisals, uh, an offer over the highest appraiser, appraisal. Uh, an engineer has to certify the sufficiency of the property. So it's, it's quite an extensive constitutional and statutory process that you will be going through before there's an order to take these properties. Our much greater preference, of course, is to reach an agreement with the landowners, and we've worked as much as we can to, to accommodate them if they have to stay longer uh, on a property. Most of the lots have been vacant, but some of them do have, have improvements on it, so we try to work with them if that's a, a, an accommodation we can make. Uh, but at this point, you know, we only go through the quick taking process once we are not able to reach an agreement. I'm happy to answer any questions. And then uh, Jacob Christ here, who is working directly with the management and the property owners, can also address any questions regarding our attempts to try to reach agreements with all of these landowners. Let's bring Jacob up. Hello, good evening, everybody. Jacob Chris with Ladder and Bloom. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. As Suzanne said, uh, my firm's role has been to work with the port to contact the landowners and express the port's interest in acquiring their properties for a public purpose. Uh, uh, we've had quite a bit of luck over the last number of years. At present, uh, the port has acquired or is in control of 63% of the acreage. This is 120, <clears throat> excuse me, of 200 total acres. You know, there, there's some owners who were uh, pleased to sell. There's some who were on the fence, others others who uh, were not interested. Some of those we've been able to talk through uh, through the process of ordering two appraisals, taking the highest of the two, and then adding a, an approved premium on top of that. As Suzanne said, uh, our, our direction from port staff has been to be transparent, uh, uh, mindful of the situation, right, thorough and uh, uh, productive, and patient while also recognizing that ultimately the port in its public purpose does need to acquire these sites. In spring of this year, we uh, reached the conclusion of our good faith negotiations, notified legal, hey, we've exhausted all reasonable uh, options and have been unsuccessful in reaching agreement on a handful of these, of these owners. That's what you see here today. Happy to answer any questions about the logic of appraisal one versus appraisal two. We've been tracking what some of these owners acquired these sites for. Again, these are good, reasonable people. Uh, it's not a personal matter. It's just we've been attempting to go through this process as diligently and uh, uh, thoroughly and professionally as possible. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Uh, it, if I may, um, we'd like to go to the public comment first and then we'll yeah. comment. But yeah, it, please. Um, um, I think as as a uh, as a as a board, and this is directed to everyone that's been involved. This was not a fun process, and I don't think that anyone here relished the thought of having to get to this point. However, uh, the decision was made to attempt to get the property by all amicable means as much as possible. Yes, sir. That doesn't mean if I'm a landowner, I'm going to be happy that you want to take my property. And I speak for any landowner. But there is a, a process, a law, that allows for a public body to do it to, for a public purpose. And it's done for rails, it's done for highways, it's done for ditches and all that. That don't mean that we like it. And I don't think any of us like it. But we do see the big picture. And uh, I know if, if you were coming to me, 
I may feel a little pressure because you're going to take my property. Now, how long do I want to wait? What, how, long, what, how much do I want to fight it? But in the end, you have a right to do it because of a, being a public body. So uh, I think that we understand that and we want the public to understand that. Mm -hmm. um, so with that, I know we have some council members uh, queued in to speak, but I'm going to open it for public comment. And during that public comment, in general, I make your comments, but also everyone will be allowed for each specific piece of property. We will still have another comment period, but in general, based on what was said, if we have any general comments to be made, we're opening the floor for that and direct the comments to us. If there's something we missed or something that we inadvertently didn't explain, we'll see that that gets done. Yeah, thank you. Anyone? Mr. Chairman, members, Donald Valley. I would like to split my five minutes to finish up where I was before, and then we'll talk about this. Stuart? About, we're talking about expropriation. That's what we're talking about. I can't use my time. This is about his conversation and his report. Well, we had that public comment period, and you were allotted your five minutes. But if there's something we need to discuss, I mean, you got my phone number, we will do it. But as far as the time of our council, please follow our rules. These are rules that we I all am, agree but let to. Me follow, let me follow that rule. I thought this was a part of his report. I made it very specific that, that first that he gave his okay. report, and that we would open right. back to the piano keys. I, pre I appreciate that, Mr. Thank Chairman. You. First off, I don't think that the public really cares about the expropriation except the four or five landowners that you got out there. I think you need to explain to them why you're taking their property and when's it going to be used and for what public purpose. And that has not been expressed openly to, to the public. And I'm not saying anything wrong with it. The real question is, what do you need the property, and when do you need the property, and how soon do you need to take it? Now, I did ask that question yesterday to Charles, and he responded. He said he needed it right away. We've got to move on this stuff. It's like you all talking about moving on the rail and Justin Parish and all this stuff. And the question is, you get ready to have a market study. What does the market study say you all do, and where do you go with the port? So I'm just going to cut it short right there, I'm not belabored. Yeah, and I appreciate uh, your comments, Susan, about uh, you would work with landowners uh, or work on behalf of us. You would work with landowners on a timeline if that was needed. So I think you answered that earlier. Right. Allowed to stay after closing. Good. Okay. Yes, sir. Clarence Bronx, 156 Crossover Land, uh, Phoenix, Louisiana. Uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm not. To, to me, this is way over my head, but the only thing I see that is uh, property will be taken for for progress. You cannot stop progress, I know that for sure. But uh, I always thought it was progress for, if you, if we want to put it in schools and put in uh, uh, grocery stores and I think that's going to help the community, but this is a, a private company a company that they're, they're taking people's property. And the only reason why I want to learn a little bit more about it, because I feel that on the east bank of Plaquemine Paris, we are next. They'll be coming on our side to take our property. So I'm in favor of the six companies. Uh, will y'all take all their property or just the right of way for, for the, for the, uh, for the real, for, uh, for the real? <clears throat> A year. So, um, just I, I'd like to comment a little bit, maybe, uh, on uh, some statistical facts, if you will. Uh, many years ago, uh, the port purchased a piece of property, um, and eventually it was leased to Venture Global. Um, the thought process is that once these properties belong to the port, it allows us 
another opportunity to lease that property. So just as a reason, uh, uh, Mr. Clarence, as a reason, uh, what was the, uh, the this year, what was the income derived off of that property that we leased to Venture Global? Well, it, it's, it's a little complicated in our financials, but I would say oh, approximately $17 million. $17 million. $17 million. So which, the goal in, in this is to have an opportunity maybe to duplicate that or even do better, but we were hamstrung in that there were properties in that big property that we owned all the surrounding area that would have prevented us from making that type of a, a uh, taking advantage of that type of opportunity. Uh, that is correct, and, and I would say that I, I, I have put on my commercial hat, and I am looking very hard at ensuring that, you know, we fully lease all of that property out as fast as we can. Uh, but we want to do it right, and we want to make sure that we have the right relationship uh, there. That's right. Mr. Henry? Expropriation. Taking people property. You know, when this port was first developed, studies show the East Bank was the appropriate place for this port. But some people decided, well, we won't put it on the West Bank. Listen, I'm for progress for the poor, but not at the expense of the people. Because what's next? I ain't done, and I, I get up when I say things, people just look in the wind. But five, six, seven years from now, we're going to be talking about Ironton being expropriated for the poor. There's a lot of vacant land on the east bank of the river that the port can certainly benefit from. I would suggest we look at those avenues first. Well, you got to build infrastructure over here. You need a level, you need a level mile railroad on the on the west bank, on the east bank. Hey, do like you do on the West Bank, but it's vacant land. But you got big property owners over there who will fight you for it, though. You know, so I'm going to leave that like it is. But what I'm trying to say is develop this port. But please, man, I don't want to be standing up here five, six, seven years from now. We want to expropriate land from the people of Ireton. Cause man, I, I, I see it coming. I see it coming. And I, I, and I just hate to see that. A whole community destroyed. Now these, these guys got to vote. Totally understand that. Totally understand it. But man, we got to start being real. And really try to help people too. Man, that's it. That, that, that's it. Thank you, Mr. Henry. I, I appreciate that, um, and and uh, I'm with you on it. Yes, sir. My name is Kyle Fleming. I'm from Point Celeste. Uh, I guess I'll start off here. I'm one of the unique situations down there. I'm in the process of putting a house up down there right now. I'm going to get to your individual piece. This is general. Okay. We'll get to your individual piece, and you'll have time to speak on it if you'd like. Yeah. All right. That'll work. Uh, what, you definitely, when your piece comes up, we want to hear okay. from you. If you have anything general, though, you want to say, you can. You have an opportunity now. Uh, most of my okay. notes are pretty. Good, good, good. Anyone else? Commissioner Jurisic. Yes, uh, Ms. Cambry, when you were negotiating with these uh, landowners, uh, how did those negotiations end up? Was it bitter? Was it, you know, because I've talked to, you know, land, one landowner specific said that it was kind of, you know, he felt like he he was strong-armed. And, uh, 
you know, we don't like to see people strong armed over their property. I'd rather see, you know, good faith effort. I'd like, you know, in, in fact, I think it needs to go where even the port director maybe confronts these people and talks to them and explains something, maybe make them feel a little better about what's going on. A lot of these properties we know are vacant, but still expropriation, as you heard, you know, if it's for a levy, highway or something, but right now we're expropriating on a maybe, and that's kind of, you know, scary. You know, will we get this port, this, this whatever's supposed to be coming or not? So, you know, I think that's some of the people's concerns. So when you were negotiating with them, what were some of their concerns? And I'm going to let Mr. Christ address the negotiation because he did that directly with the, the owners, and I would just get the closing once there was a purchase agreement. But I would like to say that the vast majority of the closings we've done for those where we've reached a private negotiation, not, not an expropriation, of course, but those that have come to a closing to do a sale after it's been negotiated by this team, that most of them were happy about the price they got. And while they might not have been thinking about selling or didn't have those plans in mind, by the time they got there, you know, I, I felt no ill will. Now, I know there's people, but, but I can tell you that everyone has been ultra sensitive to working with the, the owners, the, the community, so as to be as open and give them as generous a price that you could reasonably justify. Uh, and really, truly, the people at the closing table, for the most part, have been just fine and most of them really happy with the price being received. But as far as the direct negotiation, I'll let Jacob uh, talk about that. Yeah, just to echo those sentiments, I mean, look, it is, I would say, probably 50 percent of people at onset were interested in hearing us out. Uh, another 25 percent were on the fence and another 25 percent just abjectly said, I'm not interested for various reasons. Much of those last 25 percent are here today. Uh, the port's direction to us was to be uh, uh, understanding, compassionate, patient, generous in taking two appraisals, choosing to take the higher of the two of an independent third party, well-respected two appraisal shops uh, paid for by the port, and then offering plus 20 percent on top of that, which when reviewing that in just the scope of what's going on in the market are is, is is generous offers. Now, a generous offer to somebody who's not interested in selling for various reasons, you know, is is what it is. Okay, but as far as us attempting to be professional, pragmatic, and advance the ball on this in a respectful way, uh, we've done that to the best of our abilities. Right. Were these recent appraisals, or were these appraisals from? few years back? The appraisals uh, at question today were all, the most recent appraisal was performed uh, November, December of last year. Okay, thank you. Correct. And we notified port staff that we had reached the end point of our good faith negotiations, were unable to reach an agreement uh, in March of this year, and that's when legal stepped in. All right, thank you very thank much. Thank you. I yield. Commissioner Newsom. Yes, excuse me. One more, I got a couple. Oh, yes, sir. I don't want to. Make you keep coming back up and down. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you spoke about there was two appraisals done on each of these ordinances that are in front of us today. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Who, and and you, who, can you name those who did those appraisals? Uh, the first appraisal firm was McHenry Company. The second appraisal McHenry firm. McHenry Company. Where based out of? Uh, new, based out of New Orleans. Out of New Orleans. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, the second was Stiegel Benton and Associates. Bush Benton was the appraiser, uh, based based out of South Louisiana as well. Oh, that's a big area. Can you narrow that? I would say New Orleans specializing in river property and properties uh, impacted in, with, with maritime districts such as these. That, that was kind of Bush, Bush Both of these firms have some maritime experience? Is, is uh, yes, sir. Both are looked at as experts in, in, in the maritime space and in the industrial space for that matter. Um, so the, they got numbers on these each piece of property. Uh, so are the numbers, the appraisal, because you spoke about appraised value and 20 percent above, are these numbers strictly appraised value or? So what you see today in front of you on the five items being, request, being uh, requested for, for action for expropriation reflects the highest of the two appraisals uh -huh. plus 5 percent. Okay. 25%. The final offer 
in an attempt to reach an agreement in as generous of a manner as possible was the highest appraisal plus 20 percent. Okay, the thought process and the direction was because expropriation proceedings are more costly to the Port Authority that, you know, let's pivot to the highest appraisal, still give a premium in good faith. We are all community members here, okay, but that the 20 percent premium was not warranted in that event. So what you see is the highest of the appraisals plus 5 percent. Thank you. I yield. Thank you. Commissioner Edwards. Yeah, and, and maybe Mr. Garrett might answer this question because I heard the gentleman just use the word expropriation, and I just thought we were in negotiations to buy people property. So you're saying the port, as Mr. Brock was saying, even though it's a business, they can appropriate people land as a public purpose? Yes. Actually, the port, although they do function in some respects like a business. The port, the uh, Plaquemines Port Harbor and Terminal District is in fact a political subdivision of the state. It is a public body. And as and as a public body, it does have expropriation authority under the Louisiana Constitution. But but based on but what's the authority have to be based upon to take the, someone land? The the uh, a public body has the authority to expropriate pop property for a public purpose. In other words, property that will further the public purpose of that public entity. Okay, and I, I wanted, because I wanted Mr. De Brock to see that, because De Brock, my understanding that most of the, the property in that area was sort of vacant anyway. That That's my understanding. Am I right or wrong about that? And uh, so that's the purpose. Now, I would say this to um, Mr. Hendry, and I don't know why, he want to wish this up on, on the East Bank of the River. We have a um, little bit of property and, and houses. We won't even want to be in the position where if the port will come over, we want to establish up front the area that they're going to be in so they don't say later on they can come and take Phoenix or Arrington or any other community. We have to, at some point, respect these people, a generation to generation of people living on the land. And I know that's what Mr. Brock was saying, and just because it's a business, we want to do it. Uh, so I'm hoping that as a, a governing body, we consider that in the future. You know, especially if you're coming to the East Bank, where you look at an area where it doesn't involve where you're taking people property. And I, and I think that's what Mr. Brock was trying to say. And I, I would tell you, Mr. Brock, I would fight tooth and nail because we don't have that much of property anyway. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Konovich. Got a question for the gentleman from Ladder and Bloom. Was was it you that went out and talked to each landowner every time, or did something? Uh, it else? was me. I took assignment on this project in June of 2022 when a predecessor with our firm passed away. Okay, so that's when I got plugged in, and at that point in time, took over direct discussions with all of the owners at that time. I believe that we were able to reach an agreement with eight owners, seven or eight owners in 2022, and six to seven thus far this year. But yes, sir. Because I, I know before this, this direct and all got in, a couple of landowners came to me and they said they wanted to speak to the port direct himself to come. And I guess Sandy finally went and did it. But uh, yes, I, I'm unable to speak to exactly how that unfolded. Other than we had a, we had a, a check in June of last year, where where I was assigned to the project in place of uh, of a gentleman Patrick Egan who passed away. And then the appraisal companies, you picked them. I did not pick them. I assisted the port. Uh, they were paid for by the port and chosen by the port. I did give comment and can validate um, uh, the the capabilities of both firms. Did either one of them firms appraise Tallgrass's property? Uh, I'm not aware of any details of the Tallgrass assignment, but I'm sure we can look into to, to answer that question, not to my knowledge. Because if I was a landowner getting my land taken, that's the one I'd want because the Portland got a big uh, appraisal on the Tallgrass property. But I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Can't argue that. Good. No more comments. Um, we will um, move uh, to the next item on the agenda, and I'm going to reiterate that we'll still have public comments specific to each of these pieces of property. Item 4, bids and advertisements. There are none. Item 6, ordinances and resolutions on second reading and final passage. 
6A ordinances and public hearings pursuant to Article 6, Section 601E of the Plaquemines Parish Charter. 6A1, an ordinance authorizing and directing Charles D. Tilton, Executive Director of the Plaquemines Port Harbor and Terminal District, the Port, to have the Port's legal counsel file a petition pursuant to the Louisiana Constitution, LARS 1921, at SEEK, as well as all other applicable laws, and to expropriate via a taking that certain land owned by Nelvin J. Perrin III or their successor in title, which property is commonly referred to as Lot 61, totaling 15.35 acres and with a legal description of Lot 61. Point Celeste Farms, Phase 2, 385 feet by 1739.40 feet by 384.93 feet by 1734.69 feet with the more formal legal description of said property attached here to as Exhibit A and otherwise to provide with respect there to Commissioner Champagne. And we Champagne, you have the we, it we has do have changes. changes on line 71, which is in Section 2 of the ordinance. Um, it now reads $210,000 from the Port Land Fund as authorized by the Plaquemines Parish Council. Offered by Commissioner uh, Champagne. Is there a second? I will second. Mm -hmm. um, the um, um, ordinance has been offered by Commissioner Champagne. I have seconded. Is there anyone here uh, in regards to the property of Nelvin Perrin? Anyone representing Mr. Perrin? Okay. Um, I'll open it, Mr. Champagne. I will open it for public comment. Yeah, Mr. Port. Okay. I'm just going to read the digest uh, recap before you start, please. Uh, the port continues to move forward to purchasing the land that's identified in the piano keys for the growth and economic expansion of the port. At this time, the port seeks to purchase Lot 61 owned by Nelvin Perrin, which is approximately 15.35 acres of land. It's formerly known as Lot 61 Point Celeste Farms. Are you? Thank you, sir. I will have public comment. Mr. Chairman, I'm coming before you today to speak on behalf of Mr. Foster Caprell, owner of the Woodland Plantation, to state his concern about the appropriation of properties within and adjacent to his property. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here today. He's going to, He's up in Nova Scotia and out of town in a wedding. I think some of you all know about it. He has deathly fear of you all expanding this port big enough and trying to take or encroach upon his historic property that's in the, the Plaquemine area that you all have known for years. He would hope, even though you can't enter into any dialogue today with us, as you, your rules, he would like to try and find some happy means that we can have some assurances to his property that he can continue his business and his operations in his historic property, which is a benefit and an opportunity for Blackman Parish. And um, again, he's opposed to the appropriation of taking of people's properties in this area because people wanted to establish homesteads in this area. Uh, one of the questions that I have, and I, I know you can't, you may want to ask, answer, the two appraisals that you got. How does that measure up to 20% more money above appraised values to what's been offered to them in the past? What did they? What were they offered, and what did they decline? Not, I'll leave it with that. Thank you, sir. Public comment. Uh, first, uh, Commissioner Champagne, do you have anything before I turn it over? Okay, Commissioner Edwards. Yeah, I would like to question, even though we're appropriating this land, does that mean we don't have to give these people any money at all because they, you went to them with an offer and they refused it and you still want the property? They, we still don't have to give them any money? No, I, I, Go ahead. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, no, I think they made it clear it's the highest appraised value plus 5% in good faith. I yield. Thank you, Mr. Champion. Thank you, sir. 
Anyone else on the floor, uh, on the board? Sheen is open. And the uh, ordinance is approved with, uh, I know from District 1, abstentions from District 7 and 8, and I know from District 9, uh, it passes 5-4. Next. Six, 682, an ordinance authorizing and directing Charles D. Tilton, Executive Director of the Plaquemines Port Harbor Terminal District, to have the port's legal counsel file a petition pursuant to Louisiana Constitution, LARS 1921 at SEEK, as well as all other applicable laws, and to expropriate via a taking that certain land owned by Kyle A. Fleming or their successor in title, which property is commonly referred to as Lot 5A, 58A, totaling 751 acres and with a legal description of Lot 58A. Point Celeste Farm SD 190 feet front on Highway 23 by 1720.01 feet by 189.97 feet by 1724.91 feet with the more formal legal description of said property attached hereto as Exhibit A and otherwise to provide with respect thereto, Commissioner Champagne. And we have changes for this one also. Read the change, please. Again, in Section 2 of the Ordinance on Line 72 this time, it reads as follows, $114,450 from the Portland Fund as authorized by the Pelicans Parish Council. It's changed. Um, they've added the language after the amount of money in parentheses from the Portland Fund removed the word useless and added the word as authorized by the Plaquemines Parish Council. Okay. Yeah, there was no indication of where the money was coming from. So we have these changes on our office. Unless. 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 Uh, so offered. Is there a second? I'll second. Floor is open for public comment. Kyle Fleming points the list. So as I said, I'm one of the unique situations. I'm just in the process of trying to get a house installed down there, all of that stuff. Bought the property back in 2020. Um, when we bought the property, we also bought a modular home and got the loans to install the modular home. So I've got currently at least uh, $357,000 worth of loans out on the property that I was offered $130,000 for. And I don't see how that's fair or just. Um, no mention of anything that's gonna be done with it, with the property, once y'all take it. You know, it's, it's a tough pill to swallow. And I'm not sure how Everything's going to pan out if y'all offer 130,000. Well, now it's 114, and I've got 350,000 dollars in loans out on the property. The modular home was built before Ida. It got delivered to the person that we bought it from in New Iberia before Ida. But it's not on the property? Not yet, no, because we've been dealing with getting permits and everything. We're ready to put it in there now. Finally got the pilings up and the foundation done, and then this is what we're dealing with. The house was built before Ida, before we got any notification from the port about wanting to buy the land, all of that stuff, taking the land. You know. So where are you supposed to cut it right? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I recommend that we defer this issue because this needs to be looked into in all fairness uh, to this gentleman. Been deferred. Mr. Fleming, I know that there will be some more discussion. I would also. 
Yeah. Discussion? Yeah, let's, let's discuss. Discussion. You're up. Yes, this is another one of those situations where, as I mentioned before, I would like, you know, maybe Charles, if you could set up a meeting with this young fellow and you could talk to him as well and see what y'all can renegotiate something because it seems like he was well on the way to have something done. And, you know, if he's got all the paperwork just justifying what he spent, I mean, I think we need to relook at this situation. Okay, I'll coordinate that. Charles, yeah, you. Yeah. Anyone else? Mr. Uh, yeah, just, just wanted to say, vouch for Mr. Uh, Fleming. He's been very professional throughout the entirety of this process, right, in working with the appraiser and, tempt, and attempting to find a value that was uh, justifiable for him. An appraiser is unable to give a value hypothetically when there's not an improvement on the site. Okay, so nobody was trying to uh, unwind Mr. Fleming out of any justly due compensation. That was the situation at hand. Uh, the legal letter was sent in March of this year notifying that, hey, you know, we, we've been unable to reach agreement. So just wanted to give some context for that. He's been extremely professional. And again, given the challenge of the situation, we have more details as needed, but just wanted to make that public comment. Okay. Item has been deferred. I'm going to clear the, yeah. um, somehow. All right, got it. Just can't. Next item. Three, an ordinance authorizing and directing Charles D. Tilton, Executive Director of the Plaquemines Port Harbor and Terminal District, the Port, to have the Port's legal counsel file a petition pursuant to the Louisiana Constitution, L.A. R.S. 1921, at SEC, as well as all other applicable laws, and to expropriate via a taking that certain land owned by Carl S. and Robin M. Woodle, or their successor in title, which property is commonly referred to as Lot 54 totaling 14.43 acres and with a legal description of lot 54 points of less farms SD phase 2 369 feet on right descending side of highway 23 by 1705.78 feet by 368.93 feet by 1701.27 feet with the more formal Legal description of said property attached here to as Exhibit A and otherwise supervised with respect there to Commissioner Champagne. We have changes to this one also on, pay, on line 72 under Section 2 of the ordinance. After the $372,750, the language from the Portland Fund as authorized by the Plaquemines Parish Council, and they removed the word unless. <laughs> Offered by... Commissioner Champ, uh, commi I offer. Is there a second? I'll second. Mr. Champagne, I'm opening it to the public. Open to the public for comment. Open to the board. One more. Yeah, okay. Mr. Forche. Rob Forche. Um, I'm sitting here watching this and, and listening, and uh, I, I just can't understand. Uh, if there's nothing planned for this property right now, if we don't have a industry that's ready to occupy these properties, why are we expropriating this property from these people? It can all be done at a later point in time. Whenever we have a viable uh, land purchaser, land renter, we're, we're not going to sell anybody this property. This is going to be something that we are going to lease to a company. So why are we not waiting until we have a viable industry that is ready to plant themselves on this property? It makes absolutely no sense. Uh, I, I just feel for all these people just getting their property taken away from them for nothing, for absolutely nothing. Thank you, sir. Board, anyone on the board comment? Mr. Champagne, you ready? Yeah, if I could, I would add this. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, our predecessors bought a cow pasture, and it's the largest uh, construction project in the world at this time. So that's where we're headed. I appreciate your comments. They're duly noted, but believe me, there's a plan. So off. I yield. Dean is open.
And the ordinance is approved with no votes from District 1, District 9, and abstentions from Districts 7 and 8. It's a 5-4 vote. Next. Four will be withdrawn. Five, an ordinance authorizing and directing Charles D. Tiltson, Executive Director of the Plaquemines Port Harbor and Terminal District, to have the Port's legal counsel file a petition pursuant to the Louisiana Constitution, LARS 1921, at SEC, as well as all other applicable, applicable laws, and to expropriate via a taking that certain land owned by Kevin M. and Melanie C. Horner of their successors in title, which property is commonly referred to as Lot 51, Total in 10.36 acres and with a legal description of lot 51 points to less farms SD number two, 248 feet on right descending RW of highway 23 by 1685.62 feet, 1658.62 feet by 293.78 feet with a more formal legal description of said property attached here to, to exhibit A and otherwise to provide with respect there to Commissioner Champagne. There are changes on line 72 under section two of the ordinances after $141,750. The language from the Portland Fund has been added. The word unless has been removed and the remainder of the paragraph is as authorized by the Plaquemines Parish Council. Offered by Commissioner Champagne. Any seconds? I'll second. Mr. Champagne, open to the public. Public comment? Board comment? Sheen is open. The ordinance is approved five to four, no votes districts one and nine, and abstentions in districts seven and eight. Next. Six, an ordinance authorizing and directing Charles D. Tilton, Executive Director of the Plaquemines Port Harbor and Terminal District, to have the Port's legal counsel file a petition pursuant to the Louisiana Constitution, LA, RS 1921, at SEC, as well as all other applicable laws, and to expropriate via a taking that certain land owned by Norman C. Rouse or their successor in title, which property is commonly referred to as Lot 53 totaling 13.28 acres and with a legal description of farm lot 53 points to less farms SD phase 2 340 feet front on right descending RW of highway 23 by 1701.27 feet by 339.94 feet by 1697.11 feet with the more formal legal description of said property attached here to as exhibit A and otherwise to provide with respect there to Commissioner Champagne. These changes are also under Section 2, beginning on line 72, 168,000 from the land, from the Portland Fund, removing the word unless, as authorized by the Plaquemines Parish Council. Mr. Champagne offers, is there a second? I will second. Commissioner Champagne, public comment? Anyone from the public? Yes, sir. I got the same question. Uh, are we? Is there any kind of way we could compromise? Like, uh, I know he's going to run the railroad tracks through it, right? That's correct. Can you put the? It's more than that. Oh, it is more than that. Oh. Oh, there is other plan for the property. Right. Well, I thought they was just want to run the railroad through. Could they just take the front of it and let the people keep the land in the back? So uh, it's more than that. So. All right, thanks. Thank you, Clarence. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. How you doing? Norman Rouse, owner of Lot 53. Oh, what's your name, sir? Norman Rouse. Oh, okay, you uh, I've heard a lot about trying to get in contact with the owners. I received one letter from Ladder and Bloom, July 12th, 2022. The only letter I've received from them. I got an appraisal done from them on, well, the appraisal was done September the 20th of 2022, and I was never 
given the appraisal until March 30th of this year. And when I got the appraisal, the stipulation from your law firm says I've got 14 days to take it or leave it. Not no negotiations, not no where we at with it. Is there any working with you? It's take it or leave it. Two weeks before that, I actually got a call from one of the council members saying that I was getting a fair offer and I had one or two choices. Take it or leave it. I started back in 2018, bought the property. 2019, I started planning on putting a building up on it. 2020, as Mr. Mark knows, I went down and demoed the the gym in Buras. Tore it all down at my expense, hauled it all up, put it on the property. I had engineering done to provide with the parish to get a permit to reinstall that building. I put in thousands of cubic yards of dirt in there for a mound. I put in pylons per my engineering wreck. I paid for 5000 just to get an engineered stamp. I've got over 100,000 pounds worth of steel laying in that property. Nobody has once yet come to me to negotiate. What am I going to do with all this steel? Y'all buying it? I got over 100,000 invested on top of what I paid for this property. Nobody has come to me about going to help me. It's take it or leave it. What you've put in that property, your loss. Well, I've been hearing expropriation since 2020. These people in this council that's just been throwing it out like chewing gum, like it's just nothing to come take your property. You know, to me, it's for the public. This is expropriation for private investments, private gain. The appraisal, appraisers, was picked by the port. I'm sure they didn't pick the ones that done tall grass because been in there, not in their favor. If you take the port's dealings with property, I'm going to use one instance, the ram terminal, which turned into the tall grass, which turned into Plaquemines Port, selling to the CPRA. Over a seven-year period, I'm sorry, ten-year period, that prop property has generated $11 million in growth, extra income. But... My appraiser that I got furnished by the port don't even consider that this property has now got a FEMA-regulated hurricane protection levy built behind it. Everything's appraised as floodplains. VE, flooded property, ain't no good for nothing until the port retains it. Once the port retains it, all of these restrictions is going away, the flood Zone's going to go away, and it's all going to be profit in somebody else's hands. As far as any contact, like I say, I've got one email, one letter. Nobody else has tried. They didn't have no problem contacting me whenever it was a take-it-or-leave-it letter in 14 days on Easter weekend, Friday of Easter weekend, which left me... I'm going to tell you four days because on Tuesday the 11th, I was going in for neck surgery. And I know these people that already knew this is the reason it got thrown in on me at that time. Figured I got to bow down and take it or leave it. And I've been out three months with neck surgery. I got thrown in that this meeting was happening at 2 o'clock yesterday. So I sat down all night last night and tried to get all my paperwork back together. But I'm just saying, all of this expropriation is being thrown around like it's nothing. I mean, what do you think if they're going to come to your house and say, hey, I'm going to just take your property because I want to put a snowball stand in there for the public? 
You wouldn't like it. You want to get paid for it. You know, our property is inside of, what is it, 19, uh, 2008, after Katrina. FEMA approved a hurricane protection levy back there, 100 years. Should have been finished by now. But that's been drug out. We lost Philip 66 because that was drug out. All that levy should have done been finished. We're sitting inside prime property that commercial's coming to. But yeah, we're trying to get beat out of it so that somebody else can take the prize. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, if I could. That's all I got. Uh, just in all fairness, Mr. Rouse, I'm the, I'm the councilman who contacted Casey Rouse, and Casey's a good man. I've, I've had the privilege of working with him for a number of years, uh, uh, and he's since moved on. But uh, we, need to, we need to go back and look at this much the same as we did with Mr. Fleming. And I'm the one who did call him, and I said that they're going to offer you a fair market value. Again, don't know what that, how that all works. I'm not familiar with the appraisal process, but I did expect that it was done in a fair and equitable manner. And that's why I called my friend to make sure that they offering him, I want him to be able to get 20% above the fair and equitable value. So I recommend that we defer this so it can be relooked at. And uh, Case, I want to make sure you treat it right. I, I yield. Well, I like to throw out there too that I've, we've, couple of us has looked into getting our own appraisal, appraisers. Nobody will touch this outside of North Louisiana or Texas because of all the commotion that went on with the tall grass, the ramp terminal appraisals. Everybody's afraid they're going to get a bad name thrown out there. Nobody will touch it, and they won't touch it for less than $10,000 per lot. Mr. Rouse, we're going to not vote on this today, and we try to get the issue resolved with you. Thank you. Appreciate your comments. Yeah, thank you. Quick comment. It's nice to see you, Mr. Rouse. This is my first time meeting him. We did send a registered letter summer of last year, have made numerous attempts to reach out to him. And again, our letters and our reach out was very simple. We are Ladder and Bloom contacting you on behalf of the port to express the port's interest in acquiring your property. Nothing from Ladder and Bloom threatened expropriation, anything to that point. So Mr. Rouse was the only of the owners that never responded to us, and I can provide details of our attempts, okay? But that wasn't necessarily surprising because if he's not interested in selling the site, why would he respond to me, right? It only became a legal matter in spring of this year when we ordered a second appraisal and notified Charles, executive team, and Dwyer Cambray of the owners that we were unable to reach an agreement with, Mr. Rouse being one of them. In all due respect to Mr. Rouse and, and his property and all of those things, I'm speaking professionally, not personally here. Uh, secondly, uh, the appraisals have averaged between $1,500 to $2,400 per occurrence. There are additional appraisal firms that, if interested, we could uh, procure to have a third-party firm. Uh, having looked at this, our professional recommendation and advice to the port and to you is that these numbers are valid. We've poked as many holes in them as we can, and if we were to hire a third appraisal firm, uh, the expectation would be to solidify that. Okay, so again, with all due respect, just wanted to give some of the comment. Thank you. Uh, our ordinance for this, yes, this one shows he's got 13.28 acres and he's going to get 168, but it doesn't say what was on that property if he had anything on, or if it's just bare property. Then you got one we voted on not too long ago. He has 14.43 acres, and he got 372,000. So the Woodall's property did have an it? improvement. The Woodall's property did have an improvement, okay, and that improvement uh, uh, amounted to approximately 46% 40, of the value. Uh, the appraiser looking into the best of their ability to access the site without having the approval of the landowner because we were never able to get in touch with him, uh, our assertion was that it was a vacant site. Hey, we, he had a house we, on it, right? Us. Yes, sir, and the house was separately appraised. That's, I don't see it on our stuff. That's Understood. The Understood. This this property at hand is a vacant site in regards to the appraisal. Two items have been deferred. Thank you. We're going to take additional action and uh, come back to us and 
hopefully we come to some amicable agreement. Uh, do we have um, a resolution for an introduction? Yes. Okay, good, good. Let's move on on the agenda. Five, introduction of ordinances. Wait, did you want to do that? Mm -hmm. you That's finish? fine. Okay. okay. That's fine, yeah. yeah. Five, introduction of ordinances and resolutions. An ordinance authorizing Charles D. Tillotson as Executive Director of the Plaquemines Port Harbor and Terminal District to enter into a cooperative endeavor agreement with the Parish of Jefferson, State of Louisiana, represented herein by Scott A. Walker, Chairperson of the Jefferson Parish Council, the Parish's Governing Authority, and the City of Gretna, represented herein by Belinda Constant, its Mayor. An ordinance authorizing Charles Tillotson as executive director in the Plaquemines Port Harbor and Terminal District to enter into a cooperative endeavor agreement with the Plaquemines Parish Government for shared resources and services and otherwise to provide with respect thereto. An ordinance to amend and as amended readopt ordinance number 23-46 that created the unclassified legal position of I'm sorry, the unclassified position of legal assistant to the Port Executive Council and amend the Plaquemines Port Harbor and Terminal District manpower structure and otherwise to provide with respect thereto. An ordinance authorizing Charles Tillotson as Executive Director of the Plaquemines Port Harbor and Terminal District to enter into a due diligence discussions and negotiations for the potential purpose of the building formerly known as the Red Star Yeast Plant located at 8391 Belchase Highway, Belchase, Louisiana, 70037, and otherwise to provide with respect thereto. An ordinance authorizing and directing Charles D. Tillotson, Executive Director of the Plaquemines Port Harbor and Terminal District, to have the Port's Legal Counsel file a petition pursuant to the Louisiana Constitution, LARS 19,2.1, at SEC, as well as all other applicable laws, and to the expropriate via taking that certain land owned by Celeste D. Ancar or their successors in title, which property is commonly referred to as Lot 7, totaling four acres with the legal description of Lot 7 Point Celeste Farms, Phase 2, 200 feet by 880 feet by 890 feet by 200 feet, with the more formal legal description of said property attached here to is Exhibit A and otherwise to provide with respect thereto. An ordinance authorizing Charles Tillotson, Executive Director of the Plaquemines Port Harbor and Terminal District, to purchase land owned by Tuan Wen and otherwise to provide with respect thereto. And all of those were filed under Council Member Commissioner Gooey. And did the one go in with the CEA for Jefferson? Okay. Yeah. Seven, new business. There are no items under 7A. Eight, approval of the June 22nd, 2023 regular meeting minutes. I so, so offered by second. Commissioner Newsom, and I'll second. Yeah, unplug my. Meeting is open. Council Member Edwards. Minister approved unanimously, nine nothing. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Uh, motion by Schultz and seconded by Commissioner Newsom. The machine is open for adjournment. Councilmember McCarty. Okay. And the, um, it, yeah, it, it's unanimous for adjournment at the, of the, this meeting at 528 p.m.